going to look and see if you can read my notes down there. Uh-oh. No. Are you kidding? No. <laughs> no, but that's what's in my notes. <laughs> I just wondered if you were reading the, the introduction. Praise God. Well, grab your Bibles. Lift your Bibles, everybody. Say this out loud. This is my Bible. I have what it says I can have. I do what it says I can do. I am what it says I am. Father, in the name of Jesus, I am about to receive the incorruptible, the indestructible, the ever-living, the ever-producing seed of the living God. Father, I confess my mind is alert. My heart is receptive. My body is awake. From this moment forward, I'll never be the same. I'll never, 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 I'll never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, I believe the Holy Spirit's wanting to do some things in our lives this morning. Uh, I was listening to the praise and worship and the songs that Pastor selected. And, uh, you know, we do not uh, converse what the message is going to be like and what the Lord has prepared in my heart. And then when she came out by the Spirit of God, uh, if you listen to what the Spirit of God is doing this morning, He's going to raise you up to a higher level. That's what He wants to do. But you know what? It takes you wanting that, and it takes you being obedient to the Word. So let's get into the Word this morning, and let's just follow along what the Spirit of God is doing. Amen? Amen. Ephesians chapter 5, I want to read in the New Living Translation, or the Tinsdale Living Translation, uh, and I don't have these scriptures written before me, so I'm going to read it like you are on the screen. And so I want to read a lot of scripture this morning uh, in verse 1 through 20 and then 25 through 27. So follow along with me as we read. Uh, are we we're not in verse 20? There we go. Okay, follow God's example in everything you do just as much love child imitates his father. Follow God's love. Go to the next scripture. Go ahead. Keep going. Verse 2. Be full of love for others. Following the example of Christ who loved you and gave himself to God as a sacrifice to take away your sins. And God was pleased for Christ's love for you was like sweet perfume to him. Let there be no sexual sin, impurity, or greed among you. Let no one be able to accuse you of any such things. Dirty stories, foul talking, coarse jokes, they're not for you. Instead, remind each other of God's goodness and be thankful. You can be sure of this. The kingdom of Christ and of God will never belong to anyone who is impure or greedy. For a greedy person is really an idol worshiper. He loves and worships the good things of this life more than God. Don't be fooled by those who try to excuse these sins. For the terrible wrath of God is upon all those who do them. Don't even associate with such people. I want to stop right there just for a moment. That doesn't mean that you get rid of everybody in your life that's acting like that. But don't communicate, don't partake, don't uh, be a part of what they're doing. Be the light in their life. Don't, Don't use this scripture that says, I become all things to all men that I might win a few. That doesn't mean you participate in their sinful ways. That means you are a light to them. You become, you're friendly to them. You know, guys, where did Jesus hang out? He hung out with the publicans and the sinners so that he could lead them out of that miry pit. Amen? So that but when he says don't associate with those people, Uh, That means, you know, just don't make it a habit of hanging around those people because they will draw you down. They will pull you down. If they don't want to receive the light, hey, guys, just say, hey, you know, uh, I got better people I can hang around. But be ready. When they're ready to receive the word of God, be ready to associate with them. Amen? 
Did y'all get that? For though once your heart was full of darkness, now it's full of light from the Lord. And your behavior should show it. Now you see what he's saying here? Okay. Because of this light within you, you should do only what is good and right and true. Learn as you go along what pleases the Lord. Take no part in the worthless pleasures of evil and darkness, but instead rebuke and expose them. See, today, guys, if you've ever noticed, the left is getting so far left that they say that if we preach to them, we just don't love them. No, I love you. That's why I'm preaching to you. Uh, you know, I'm not condemning you. I'm telling you, you need to come out of this darkness. But if we don't preach the truth, how are they going to know the truth? They're so far over there in darkness, guys. I mean, it is, it is really crazy. Now, I'm not going to get over into politics, but I heard this. Many people are so far over on the left that, and, and don't, don't comment, don't look at me. I'm not judging anybody. I'm just repeating statements. They're saying that the wall that our president wants to build is immoral. Don't, 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 don't. Everybody just look straight ahead because we don't want you to get into politics, all right? But yet, just last week in New York, they passed a bill giving a, 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 a uh, authority or giving the ability to do full term abortions and they're not calling that immoral to commit murder is not immoral but to build a wall to protect people I, I, you know let me get over I am going to do a little soapbox here if it's immoral to build a wall then take all the locks off of your doors if it's immoral to build a wall, then unlock your car out there. When you go to the mall, don't lock your car. Why do we do that? We, to keep honest people honest. To protect your stuff. How many of you lock your doors at night and set your alarms? Well, that's immoral. You're keeping the bad people out of your house. You see, it, to us it doesn't make sense because we see the light. It's not that we're against anybody. It's not that we don't love people. We do love people. Amen. But we, we need to uh, protect ourselves. Amen. Let's go on. It would be a shameful even to mention here those pleasures of darkness that the ungodly people do. But when you expose them, the light shines in upon their sin and shows it up. That's why they get mad at you, because when you preach the gospel, it shows that their ways are error. The Bible, you know, there's one thing about any kind of a religion that you can study, and Brother Tony was here a couple weeks ago and taught us about the history of churches and things. There's one thing that, that is in common. It, everybody starts their church out of the Bible. So, well, if the Bible is God's word and we use the Bible, then let's use the whole thing. Amen. But when you expose them, the light shines in upon their sin and shows it up. And when they see how wrong they really are, some of them may even become children of light. You see, what they're trying to do, what the devil's trying to do is stop us from evangelizing. And he's trying to keep people from coming to churches. There are people that are criticizing every type of ministry there is. Amen. Instead of us criticizing one another, why don't we get together and just all love the Lord? Amen. Amen. That's why God says in the scriptures, Awake, O sleeper, rise up from the dead, and Christ shall give you light. So be careful how you act. These are difficult days. Boy, and he was talking way back then. How difficult is it now? Don't be fools. Be wise. Make the most of every opportunity that you have for doing good. Don't act thoughtlessly, but try to find out and do whatever the Lord wants you to do. Don't drink too much wine, for many evils lie along that path. Be filled instead with the Holy Spirit and controlled by Him. 
talk with each other much about the Lord, quoting psalms and hymns and singing sacred songs, making music in your hearts to the Lord. Always give thanks for everything to our God and Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And you husbands, show the same kind of love for your wives as Christ showed to the church, and he died for her. Guys, there are many people today that are in marriage and counseling and they're bucking heads because they're standing toe-to-toe trying to figure out which one is uh, the head of the household. And, I mean, it's confusing today. Well, let's just line it up with the Bible. Amen. Husbands, if you ever get in an area uh, with your wife and you don't know what the answer is, just act like Jesus. Give yourself to your wife. That's the example. Give in to her. Well, yeah, but what if I'm right? It it didn't say anything about right or wrong, did it? Well, we don't like this, so let's go on. (laughs) Go to the next one, Jeremy. Make her holy and clean, washed by baptism and God's word. Let the Lord deal with one another. You know, Pastor and I learned a long time ago, there are things that we're never going to do that are exactly alike. We may put the toothpaste on the counter different. We may, I mean, you should see our our counters. And I imagine it's just, I get, pastor's got two great big closets and I get one little bitty one. Her, Her part on the sink has got all the makeup and all of this and I got one little bottle over here. I'm not gonna complain about that. That's the way I like my part of the sink. That's my part of the counter. So I keep my part the way I want to and let her keep her part the way she wants to. I am not going to gripe at her and say, you've got to make yours look just like mine. Well, what if she said, well, I want yours to look just like mine and stack yours up full of stuff. You you know, what's the big deal about it? I just put my blinder on and stick on my side. (laughs) Amen. We each have our own cave. Her cave looks different than my cave. Does that make it right or wrong? No, it's her cave. Let her treat it the way she wants to treat it. Her office is the way she wants her office. That's not my office. You you understand, we fuss about these crazy little things. It don't mean anything. Amen, let's go on. So you could give her to himself as a glorious church without single spot or wrinkle or any blemish, being holy and without a single fault. You see, God will deal with all of us. And we're together as a family in the church. None of you are going to do exactly the same as another person. You may do some similarities, but we have to learn to live with one another. And just because we do things differently, it doesn't make it wrong. It's just who we are. Are you listening to me? There are certain guidelines we'd like to see everybody doing in the church, but I understand there are some of you that aren't going to ever do it. It's true. Uh, Pam has been a part of this church since 1984. And if I ever have heard her shout or lift her hands and praise God in the church, I I bet I could count it on one hand. She's just very reserved. It's never going to change until she decides that, hey, I'm just going to let it all out. There are some people that run in the church, some people that shout, some people, I mean, let's just let everybody praise God the way they want to. Amen. All right, let's go on. You all not liking this very much. Do we have another scripture there or is that it? That was it for that reference? All right, turn to Matthew chapter 24. We're talking about the guidelines of the Lord. Amen. Matthew 24, 42, Tinsdale Living Bible. Again, this is more reading. Listen to this. So be prepared. You don't know what day your Lord is coming. Does anybody know? If anybody raises your hand, you better put it down. Because you do not know. Just as a man can prevent trouble from thieves by keeping watch over them, so you can avoid trouble by always being ready for my unannounced return. The Lord's not going to announce when he's coming back. He's just going to split the sky and come back. Amen? But he wants you to, that's why he wants you to be ready every moment of every day, all the time. 
Pam's not here today, but I remember when she first started the church, she got a revelation that the Lord is with her everywhere, even in the bathtub. So he's watching you. He sees you. He knows everything you're doing. Are you a wise and faithful servant of the Lord? Have I given you the task of managing my household to feed my children day by day? Blessing on you if I return and find you faithfully doing your work. Now he's talking about, first of all, working on yourself. Doing what he tells you to do. It's time that we wake up and stop trying to change other people. Amen. I heard a, a program that this guy started dating a girl and he dated her for, I don't know, three or four times. And then she started telling him, well, uh, you know, you do this and why don't you do it like this? And so he went to work one day and he told his secretary, he says, you know, he says, I don't understand women. He said, you know, you meet us and you start to, you like us and you go out with us. And then after two or three times, you start trying to change us. And he says, and as near as I can figure, you try to change us into being a woman. No, y'all don't like that either. All right. I'll put such faithful ones in charge of everything that I own. But if you are evil and say to yourself, my Lord won't be coming for a while, and begin oppressing your fellow servants, partying and getting drunk, your Lord will arrive unannounced and unexpected, and severally whip you and send you off to the judgment of the hip hypocrites. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. People are not going to be happy. If the Lord would come, right when you're acting in a particular way, would he take you or leave you? Think about that. You know, I, I'm, I wish Pastor Jason was here today because this message has a lot to do with him and Christian and they're not here. But I'm going to go on and I'm going to preach it anyway. Back in June of 2013... Pastor Jason and I took a fishing trip to Minnesota. Now, we, we, we had gone on several fishing trips, and I'll make reference to one that we went into in Canada, but we had never been fishing in Minnesota before. We came from Michigan. We owned a resort in uh, northern Michigan. We knew all the guidelines and things in Michigan. But when we went to Minnesota, it was different. And so we didn't understand their regulations and their guidelines. Uh, but they, the Department of Natural Resources in all of these areas, including Oklahoma, they study the lakes and they study the fish and all of these things. And uh, they did, in this study, they determine the fish in the lake and how to preserve them and how to uh, get the most out of that. Uh, so in their research you know, over the years, they put together a guideline, put together a book. And uh, it was really interesting in uh, Minnesota... They, this lake we were fishing, and some of these fish you may not know, but uh, the crappie, uh, the bluegill, and the smallmouth bass, the yellow perch, uh, you could keep them at your discretion. There was no size limit on them. If you thought it was an, an okay fish and there was enough in it for you and you wanted to eat it, you could keep it. But there were also other species of fish. Uh, they had walleye, they had northern pike, and they had muskie in this lake then that's where you get into reading the book, where you've got to understand. When you catch a northern pike in Minnesota, it has to be either under 23 inches. If it's under 23 inches, you could keep it. If it was over that, uh, you had to wait. If it was between 23 inches and 36 inches, you had to put it back. So I remember Christian caught this one fish, and it was a nice fish. It was about 26 inches. It was a nice-looking pike, and... He measured it out, and Pastor Jason said, you got to put it back. And he said, but let me take a picture of it before you put it back in the water. No, if I can't keep it, I'm not taking a picture. And he threw it back in the lake. He was so upset because he couldn't keep it. It was a nice fish, but he couldn't keep it. It wasn't within the guidelines. A walleye has to be under 18 inches, and you can keep it, or it has to be over 24 inches. So between 18 and 24, you couldn't keep it. You had to throw it back. Now, the muskie is a very interesting fish. Anything under 
48 inches, you could not keep it. It had to be four, at least four foot big in order for you to keep it. If it was anything less than that, you had to put it back. And you could only keep one that was over 48 inches long. So, you know, if it was over 48 inches or if it fit in these guidelines, uh, it had to qualify within these guidelines in order for it to be a keeper. Can I have an amen? And I began to think about that, you know, uh, over the years, uh, the guidelines for keeping this fish. And I began to turn my thoughts around to the church, the 21st century church. What are the guidelines that we need to be in in order for us to be a keeper? And I began to read the Bible, and we looked at some of these scriptures already. And as Christians, I believe we need to pay attention to the guidelines. I think we're losing sight of it. Now, that was not first nature for us in Minnesota. We carried the book with us. And when we caught a fish, we'd open the book to see if it was within the guideline. There are a lot of new Christians that have concepts or ideas on what it is to be a Christian. I believe you need to keep the book and open the book and find out if what you're doing qualifies. Because if you look at the world system, you're going to get over there in the world system of doing things, and you're not going to qualify to be a keeper. Amen. Let's, the first question that I want to ask then is, what is it qualif- how am I qualified to be a keeper? Turn to John chapter 3, and let's look at verse 3. Nicodemus was a religious leader in the uh, uh, day, and he came to Jesus, and he said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So the first thing that we need to see is, it doesn't matter how long you've been in church, doesn't matter how much you've read your Bible, doesn't matter how many books you've studied, it doesn't matter uh, uh, what kind of classes you've gone through in your church or whatever, if you're not born again, you don't qualify to be a keeper. The first thing the Bible says is you must be born again. That was a a silly concept to me, just like it was to Nicodemus. He said, how can a man be born again? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? No, those that are born of the flesh are born of the flesh. Those that are born of the spirit are the spirit. You've got to be born of the water and of the spirit. So you've got to be born again. Well, all right, if I've got to be born again, then how do I do that? Turn to Romans chapter 10. These are the guidelines. This is your guideline book, Romans 10, verse 8. Romans 10, 8 says this, But what saith it? The word is nigh you, even in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach, that if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So to be born again, we, try, we, we, we want to go out there and preach and complicate the whole thing and answer all these religious questions to people. No, the bottom line is, I like the way Pastor Dorothy does it, who is Jesus to you? Bottom line. Well, where did Adam and Eve get their children? And, 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 and how about Jonah? How can he live in the in a fish? For, who cares about all of that stuff? Are you born again? Who is Jesus to you? If you're not born again and you don't know Jesus, you're not going to understand all of those things. How in the world could God have Noah build a boat and put all those animals on that boat? Who cares? Are you born again? All of these religious questions don't mean anything. And if you're born again and then you begin to see through the light of the glorious gospel, then you will begin to understand some of these things. And if you don't understand them, you receive it by faith. Amen. So we need to just share with them the simple gospel Do you believe in Jesus Christ? And if you don't, I'm going to tell you about him. And then if they begin to believe in that, then ask them, do you believe this? Yes. Then say it out loud. I'm born again. Jesus is my Lord and Savior. You don't have to go through a long, drawn-out prayer. We were taught in one church that in order to get saved, it's important for you to confess every sin that you've ever done. I looked at the pastor and I said, What if I forget one? That's the craziest thing I've ever heard. The only sin that they're guilty of is not accepting Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. 
That's it. Then the slate is washed clean. Amen. That's evangelism. Tell them about Jesus and tell them how to be born again. And you know, then close the deal. Don't preach to them about Jesus. Keep asking them about Jesus. And then don't ask them the bottom line. Is there any reason that you would not accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today? Bottom line. And then shut up and let them think about it. Well, yeah, because of this. And answer their question. Well, that's not an issue. Do you believe in Jesus? Yes, then let me pray with you. Lead them to Jesus. And then give them your cell phone and have them call somebody and tell them they just got born again. Simple. We complicate it. Amen. Are you all listening? All right. The next thing that we need, turn to 2 Corinthians 5.17. This is a guideline for being a keeper. Say, I'm a keeper. So, or say, I want to be a keeper. <laughs> 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this. It says, if any person is in Christ Jesus. Did I lose you, Jeremy? 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, if anyone is in Christ He's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new, and all things are of God. And he's given everybody the ministry of preaching. Reconciliation. That's what qualifies you to be a keeper. Live it and then preach it. I like what one minister said. He said, go out into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And if it's necessary, say something to them. That means you live it before them. If you're living it before them, they'll uh, see it. Amen. All right, let's go on very quickly. Turn to Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. This is something that's very important. You and I need to work out our own salvation. We are all at different levels. Amen. Today after church, I am not going to give my grandson... uh, Uh, or my great-grandson, Sammy, the keys to my truck and say, I'll meet you at the restaurant. His dad might like that, but I I don't think Sammy would like it, and I wouldn't like it either. Why? He's at a different level. He's not ready to drive a truck. You see, we're trying to expect so much out of newborn Christians. Guys, give them a chance to work out their salvation. We want to lay down all these guidelines. Well, you've got to do this and do this and do this and do that and do that and change this and change that. No, just let them go to church and read the Bible. Tell them to read the gospel of John like you're doing and let them work it out. Amen. And they're going to work it out at their level. Philippians 2, 12 through 16 says this. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in the presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That doesn't mean I have to work out your salvation. Work on your own salvation. How many, how many of you in here are perfect? Look around and look at the hands that are around here this morning. Now, the Bible does tell you in Corinthians, I'll let you read the whole book, that there is a time when you can correct me and judge me. There is a time. And you know when that is? When you're perfect. Otherwise, keep your tongue off of me. Amen. Keep your tongue off of one another. Hello? Okay, you're not liking this message. Where is pastor? She started this. <laughs> Look at verse, uh, the next verse. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Boy, is it crooked and perverse today among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Glory to God. Guys, you know, we look at the world today and we listen to all of these fussing and these things that are going on and we think it's new. It's not new. Read the Bible. My goodness, it got so bad in times past that they were even eating their own children. The poverty got so bad, the economy got so bad, that they were doing anything to buy a little morsel of food. 
Are you listening to me? Guys, none of this stuff is new. They were sacrificing their children to idols and everything else. And I believe that's what's going on today. It's just in a different form. Are you listening? Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, it's very simple, and you all know this one. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. It's your reasonable service. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed. How? We talked about this Friday night. Renew your mind. Renew your mind. You've got to change your thinking to line up with God's thinking. How many of you want to be a keeper? Anybody want to be a keeper? Praise God. There are thir- certain things that God wants us to work on in our lives. You know, holiness hasn't changed. The Bible hasn't changed. It's not a popular message today, but it's still the same message. It hasn't changed. Well, Pastor, you're just old school. No, I'm not old school. I came out of a traditional church where anything you wanted to do was okay. Didn't matter. Are you listening? Some of you came out of that kind of a church. Very liberal church. They're very liberal. And there are a lot of people still go to them. Pack them out. Why? Because they can do anything they want to do and it's okay. Woe be to that pastor for not telling them the truth. Amen. Colossians chapter 3, verse 8 and 9. Colossians 3, 8 and 9, it says, Now you yourselves are to put off these things. So take control of it, change your thinking, and control your flesh. Put off anger. Put off wrath and malice and blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you've put off the old man with his deeds. Let's go on. Where are we at? I don't have any of these scriptures down here. So we've got to put off all these things. Look at verse 12 now. He wants you to put on the new man. Therefore, as the elect of God, you put off all that other stuff. Now he wants you to be a keeper, right? As an elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercy, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. Guys, I know in this world that we're living in, you know, we have get, we've get abused, we get uh, mistreated, and you want to get hard. You want to, you want to be like the disciples, just call fire down from heaven on them. You know, I, I, I've got to really be careful of watching the news and watch what's going on in the politics because, man, I want to call fire down on some people. I even said, Lord, can I pray that this person dies? I mean, you know, that's, how else are we going to get this straightened out? And so I have to just say, Lord, you're in control of this. As long as I'm praying and doing my part, then it gives you free reign to get in there and change these things. Amen. So you have to be careful, guys, because you'll get your mouth on people, and that's not good for you. All right, so we've got to work on being keepers. Let's look at another scripture in 2 Corinthians 7.1. I want you to notice something that we all have, what all these scriptures have in common here. It says, therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves. Work on yourself. You should have so much to do in your life that you don't have time to work on anybody else. Amen. Cleanse yourself from all filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Perfect holiness in the fear of God. 1 Thessalonians 3, 12 and 13 says, And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we do to you, so that he may establish your heart blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Do you qualify to be a keeper? Hmm. Think about that. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 7 says, For God did not call us to uncleanness, but to holiness. 
we want to go up on higher ground, then we need to make some changes in our lives. Hallelujah. Uh, Destiny, would you find Grandma and tell her I need her in this service? Okay, go find her. She started this. So we need to uh, realize that we are called into holiness. Not to act like the world. Amen? It is not acceptable. It doesn't matter what they do. Amen? Let's not get in and be a part of them. All right, so how do I become holy then? Let's look at Hebrews chapter 12. Let's look at verse 10 and 11. For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seeming best. Just talk about your earthly father. But he for our profit that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Amen. We get trained by the word of God. The word of God chastens us, child trains us, corrects us, perfects us, leads us into holiness, and makes us keepers. Can I have an amen? Turn over, if you would, then, to Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20 through 23. How do I work on this holiness, Pastor? That doesn't mean we stand there and keep correcting one another. It means we get into the Word of God. Find out what the Word of God says about your lifestyle and what you're doing, and if you find something He wants you to change, then change it. Amen. My son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to their saying. Do not let them depart from your eyes. That's why as a church, we're reading the Gospel of John. Today is John chapter 12. We're going to read it through three times. Why? Because that tells you all about the life of Jesus. Amen? He says, don't let it depart from your eyes. Keep it in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those that find them. Health to all your flesh. It doesn't matter what's going on in your flesh or what's ailing you. You get the word of God down in your heart and it'll change the flesh. Keep your heart with all diligence. Out of it spring the issues of life. Out of your heart. Out of your heart. When things and opposition come against you, what's in your heart? What's going to come out? If you'll listen to your mouth when a rough situation comes, you'll know what's in your heart. Your mouth will expose you. And if you listen to it, you'll realize, oh, I've got to change that. That's what's in my heart. I've got to work on that. Can I have an amen? amen? 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. You know what this says. All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God, profitable for doctrine, reproof, and correction, and for instruction in righteousness. You want to become righteous and holy, working out righteous? Now, we understand when you're born again, you become as righteous as you're going to become. But you've got to work on your flesh, doing acts of righteousness, fruits of righteousness. Pastor asked me the question the other day. She said, what are the fruits of righteousness? I said, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithful, meekness, temperance, against there is no law. She says, no, that's the fruit of the Spirit. Ooh, I guess I don't know what the fruits of righteousness are. I guess I better find out. You see what came out of me? She said fruit, and I thought of the fruit of the Spirit. How many of you can tell me what the fruit of righteousness is? Yeah, that's okay, well, let's find out together. James chapter 1, verse 22. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, and then he goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty, what is that? Talk to me. The word of God. And continues in it. And is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of that work. This one will be a keeper. Can I have an amen? Are you a keeper? Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Glory to God. You know, Pastor Jason and I have been fishing, many types of fishing and all around. And, uh, but I want to talk to you a little bit about a fishing trip that we took to Canada. Uh, we were able to keep a lot of fish, uh, but not all of them were keepers. We had to throw some back. But there was one time. We were, we were in two different boats. Pastor Jason was, had Christian in his boat, and I had Derek in my boat. And we were fishing, oh, I don't know, within 50 yards of one another. And Actually, I wasn't very enthused about this particular day. For some reason, we didn't get out of the dock early in the morning. And if you know anything about fishing, there's a good time in the morning and a good time in the evening. Kind of in the middle of the day, they don't feed and you don't catch a lot. Well, for some reason, we didn't leave the dock until about 10 or 11 o'clock. I don't know why we just slept in or whatever. And so Pastor Jason said, well, let's go ahead and go anyway. And he said, I want to go way back up in that far corner about, I forget how many miles, five or six miles away. They, he said, that's where you need to go if you catch the big pike. And he says, I want to go up in that area. I said, Jason, that's a long ways off and it's already 11 o'clock. I said, but, you know, if that's what you want to do, it'll be a fun boat ride anyway. So we went up way up in this cove. And Derek and I were fishing over on one side, and him and Christian were fishing on the other side, and we were in these lily pads, and by the time we got there, it must have been 12, 12 1 o'clock. It was, it was way across the lake. And all of a sudden, Jason said, Dad, get the net! I got one! And so I'm, I had to get the boat and get over there to him. Show, this, show them this fi- uh, picture, Jeremy. This is a fish that Pastor Jason had hooked on to, against all odds, against all circumstances, and I'm over there trying to get to him to get the net and land this boat, or land this fish in the boat. And I think it's really interesting. Show the next picture. We got back to the dock, and this is the fish that Pastor Jason caught. He said, Dad, I got one. Get the net. Now, I want to give you an idea of just how big this fish was. Show the next slide. That's Christian and Derek holding that fish up. And I think those guys were maybe about 10 or 11 years old. And so that's probably about almost four foot long. I can't remember the stats of the fish. But he was so pumped up because he found one in this particular fishing hole. And he hooked one and we actually landed it. And today that's probably still one of our favorite places to go. You can turn the lights on and... Shut the slide off. But what I wanted to get with you in all of that was, after all of the looking that we did, and there's miles and miles and miles and miles of lake, but there are specific places where you can go to catch particular fish. And when you learn that lake, there are particular places where you can go to catch the yellow perch. I like to go to that hole because I can catch 30 or 40 of those and have a nice perch meal. There's a certain place where you go in that lake where at about 6 o'clock in the evening or 7 o'clock in the evening, you can head across the lake and you'll see a bunch of boats all anchored around this one hole because that's where the wall I like to congregate. And so you know where to go to find the ones that are the keepers. Are you getting this? Now there's one thing that happens... When you catch the fish, I'm going to go back to Minnesota. They have a different custom there in Minnesota. Where we go in Canada, uh, the dock hand will clean your fish if you want them to, or you can clean them yourself. But in Minnesota, the dock hand, when you come in at night, uh, you just dock your boat and you just leave the fish in the live well. And then during the night, he comes through and he gets everybody's fish out of the live well. He cleans them, puts them in baggies, and then freezes them for you and puts your name on them. Well, this one particular night, we uh, came in, we docked our boat, went in, ate, uh, and then went to bed. Got up the next morning, and we looked in the live well, and the dock hand had forgot uh, a couple of fish and left them in there overnight. And they rotted, and they weren't good to eat anymore. And I looked at that, and I thought, I think about that, Lord. We caught the fish, we put them in the live well, And we brought them to the dock, but the dock hand didn't do his diligent part in taking care of the fish. And I thought about that, and I thought, 
It's much like the church today. The Holy Spirit catches people, brings them into the dock, which is the church, and there are many pastors that aren't being diligent about taking care of the catch that the Lord has. It's much like that pastor taking care of the the fish that the Lord brings in. And it's important, I believe, that in a church, and Pastor Dorothy and I take it very seriously, that when the Lord brings somebody in, that we do our best as dock hands to take care of you and not leave any of you to rot and go without. So the thing that I want to see today, the thing that comes back to me is this. I believe that the Holy Spirit will have his favorite fishing holes. And I believe that New Beginnings Family Church is going to be one of those fishing holes. Hallelujah. Where the Lord has his favorites. Where he knows where he can go and catch some keepers. Hallelujah. Can't you just hear Jesus now when he comes back? Father, get the net! I got one! Stand on your feet, everybody. When the Lord returns... The question that I have for you today is, will he keep you or throw you back? Will you be within the limits? Will you be living the righteous life? If you want to know what the Lord is looking for, in Luke chapter 18, verse 8, it says, when the Lord returns, will he find faith? Today, will he find faith? When he returns. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Nobody looking around. I believe the Lord is wanting to do a mighty work in here today. I believe he's wanting to take us to a new level. He's wanting to raise us up. He's wanting to take us up to higher ground. Today, if this message is speaking to you and the Lord is speaking to you, and you want to be one of those ones that he comes for and that he keeps... And the Lord is working with you in some areas. You know that. We didn't go into specifics. We just read the scripture to you. We told you what the qualifying book says. The guidelines of what the book says. And as we were reading those guidelines, if the Lord spoke to you in an area, and you say, yeah, pastor, that's me. I need to work in that area. I want you to come. We want you to line up right here. No matter what it is, I believe the Lord is speaking to a lot of people to make a lot of changes to go to the next level, to go to the higher ground. Is he finding faith? Is he finding love? Is he finding righteousness, works of holiness? Or is he finding malice, contention, strife, and division, and gossip? No. Is he finding lying tongues? Or is the Lord telling you to clean up some things in your life? If he's telling you to clean up some areas of your life, step up to the next higher level of faith, whatever he's talking to you about. This is, about, this is individuals. This is not about couples. This is not about, uh, I don't want you being here at the altar saying, Pastor, I wish my friend would have heard this message. No, this is not what that's about. This is about you. This is about each one of us. The Lord got me. The Lord got Pastor Dorothy. She got me and got the Lord her and the Lord got me. I have to find out what the fruits of righteousness are. I have to restudy that. Anyone else before we pray for those that have come? Anyone else? Hallelujah. Now, guys, we're not going to, this is personal. We're not going to get over there and ask you what you're here for. Not going to do that. This is between you and the Lord. So we're going to lay hands on you because... Both of us have the same anointing today for the same purpose, to take us to higher ground and to act holy and righteous before God. Pastor started it, and again, she didn't have my outline. She didn't even know. The only person that saw the scriptures before church was Jeremy, and he didn't preach it. This is about you. So now I want you to remember this scripture. Don't look at these scriptures today and then walk away and not do anything with it. But be a hearer and a doer. 
in Jesus' name. So we're going to impart this anointing to you today that what you're desiring is going to come upon you and give you the strength and the ability to do that what the Lord is telling you to do. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for this message today, rising us up to higher ground. Hallelujah. Perfecting those things concerning us and giving us wisdom to deal wisely in the things of this world, to be examples, examples unto those that are in darkness. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. We thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, casting down all bitterness and strife and any of that malice that would come into our hearts to pollute us. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You know, when we were fishing in these lakes, the yellow perch got a disease. They got a parasite on them. And even though they were keepers as far as what they looked like, If they had this parasite on them, you had to throw them back because they were polluted. And I believe that's happened to many Christians. We look like we're in keeper's state. We look like we're keepers. But there's a parasite that has attached itself to us, however it got there. And I believe we need to take care of that. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you, Lord, for the cleansing, the cleansing power of the Holy Spirit of God to help us to perfect those things concerning us, to give us the strength to do that, which we know to do, those things that we desire to do. Just as the Apostle Paul fought in the flesh, he said, I know to do right and I want to do right, but I inevitably do wrong. Oh, what a wretched person that I am. He said, who will deliver me from this? The Holy Spirit is the power behind the word of God. And we thank you for it in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father God. There's no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus that are seeking after the flesh, seeking after the spirit, not after the flesh. So right now, don't judge yourself so harshly. Just keep going, keep growing, keep going on in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Let the word judge you. Don't judge yourself. (laughs) But be easier on yourself. Have some fun. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord, for the healing power of God. It's taking place, Father God, spiritually, physically, mentally, restoration. Lord, you said you would restore the years that the canker worm has eaten and the caterpillar and the palmer worm have destroyed. So I thank you, Lord, that you're renewing our strength like the eagle. Hallelujah. That we live long and live strong. I thank you, Lord, for the the surgery that's going on in, in his knees, Lord, for the surgeons and for the anesthesiologists and for a great surgery. In Jesus' name. And speedy recovery above and beyond what they say in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, Father, we're so thankful. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. Mm. You having a headache today, Sherry? Oh, man. Oh, my. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the healing power of God. Oh, that feels so good. That feels so good. You leave her alone. Headache, you loose her and let her go. Tension in her body, you loose her and let her go. That she would relax. Whoa. Thank you, Lord. Where's the headache gone now? It's gone? Down into the sh- down in your neck and your shoulder. Thank you, Father. It's got to go in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. I believe you receive that anointing right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. It feels pretty good. Thank you, Lord. You didn't even know. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. (laughs) Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Turn my microphone off. I'm not going to say this right now. 
Come join us at New Beginnings Family Church, located in Mustang, Oklahoma, at 1615 East State Highway 152. You can find us online on Facebook and YouTube or at walkbyfaith.info. To contact us, call 405-261-6887. And remember, you don't need a second chance. You need a new beginning.